Good evening. Peace. God bless you. Thank you for joining. Hallelujah. We're going to get started in just a moment. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise your name, God. We glorify you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your name, God. Hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> I pray that you haven't had a wonderful day. Praise the Lord. Truly, God is good. His mercy endures forever. I can hear you. Thank you, Lord God. Bless your name, God. Bless your name. Amen. Amen. Good, good evening, Pastor Terry. God bless you. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I was just looking up some additional notes here. Give me one second here. Okay. Now. Praise God. Praise God. Boom. All blessings flow. Amen. Amen. Father, this evening we come in for your awesome presence saying thank you for another blessed day you have created. We thank you for the gift of life, your strength being made perfect in our weaknesses, O oh God. We thank you for the cleansing blood of the Lamb that washed away our sins and iniquity, O oh God. We find ourselves falling short of your glory, that you have an intercessor, the great high priest who ever abides and lives to make intercession for us, that we can come boldly for your throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in a time of need. We thank you for the victory, God, in Christ Jesus. We thank you that you're, you're all powerful, you're all knowing. You know everything about us, God, and that you're working in our lives to will and do according to your good pleasure. We ask tonight, O oh God, that you make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that my heart will be engraved with your word to speak according to the spirit, leadership, O oh God, a word that will help challenge, provoke, edify, build us up in our faith tonight, O oh God. Remove the business from the day from our minds, Forgive us for our sins, knowing unknowingly, God, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have nothing to hinder us, O oh God, from receiving your word on tonight. We even pray healing, Father God, for all of those who are afflicted, God, my mother and Pastor Terry and her husband, Father God, and uh, continue to bless the Father God. Many of the people on our prayer list, O oh God, that would be healed and delivered from their infirmity, sickness, and diseases. We thank you, Lord God. And so many different people to pray for. Deacon Cannon, Father God, we pray for him this evening, God. Brother Willie, Father, we pray for him. We pray, Father God, for Father God, um, um, Mother Wilson, Father God, all the different people, Father God, who have been afflicted with cancer in this season. Father God, that you touch their bodies in a supernatural way to manifest your power, God, that you would be glorified. We give you praise, oh God, because we're going to see a miracle. We're going to see the victory, God, manifest in our lives as we trust it in your word because greater is he that's in us and he that's in the world. Not only that, Father God, you spoke, it was done, you commanded, and it stood fast, and the word is established in heaven forever. Ever, and your word shall manifest, God. We believe, oh God, in the power of the word of God, Father, with the blood of the Lamb working in our bodies, oh God, to manifest your glory. And we give you praise, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. God is so good. In spite of all the different things we have been going through, the different uh, trials and tests that many are suffering with affliction, so many different people in this season have been afflicted with cancer. I, I tell you, it got to be something in the food or something in the air or something going on that's affecting our bodies. And we come in the name of Jesus, believing in the power of the blood of the Lamb. We plead the blood of Jesus tonight against all these diseases and afflictions that come upon the people of God, that they will continue to believe, have faith in God, that God is able to bring them through victoriously. Because the word tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please God. So we got to have faith in God's word and his ability to do what he promised to do in our lives. And stand on that word, knowing that there's the word, you're going to prevail. The word is what we shall live by. He said, man shall live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the what? Mouth of God. Amen. Last week, we began our chapter in chapter 10. Again, I want to thank you all for tuning in, even those who may see this video later on. 
um, throughout the week. I think glad to see my sign on tonight as well. God bless you. Amen. Uh, uh, Minister Denise, uh, Deborah, uh, Minister Deborah and Pastor Denise, all of you. And it's such a blessing. God is doing something great in our lives tonight. But we got to keep on trusting in God's word. We can't allow our situations or our circumstances to paralyze us, to cripple us from walking in the fullness of who God is in our lives. Because I come to tell you tonight that if you don't have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll never see the mountains move in your life, which is your condition, the mountain of discouragement, the mountains of, 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 of lack of self-control, the mountains of problems and issues in your life will never move until you get realigned with the Spirit of living God and begin to speak the word. One thing I love about Jesus, anytime someone came to him to be healed, he spoke a word. He spoke a word. And that word gave them the power to either come or be prepared from him. And many occasions when people came seeking to be healed, he asked them, he said, what do you want me to do? He said, then he said, be it done according to your faith. Why? Because it's the faith that we have in God's ability to manifest his power to bring healing in our bodies or deliverance in our lives. It only comes from the power of the Holy Spirit and we can never be free if we don't never believe, stand, trust, and abide in the word of God. It's very important we abide in the word. Hallelujah. The devil's a lie. But anyway, the last week we started talking about um, Jesus offended some people by obeying his father, but never caused an offense in order to assert, to assert his own rights. And one thing we, we come to discover in our lesson of last week is humility. In order to be the greatest in the kingdom, you have to be a servant. You can't allow yourself to get into a place of a prideful mindset or prideful heart where you rebel against God's will, even serving his people. Many times when Jesus demonstrated to his disciples, even when people were offended by who he claimed to be and what he said and what the, and the teachings that he established with them, he taught them many parables because he knew that they would have understanding of the mysteries of the gospel and mysteries of the kingdom of God. But because those who were not part of him, they couldn't understand what he's talking about, so they became offended. And so Jesus knew that people would become offended by the truth of who he is. And one thing Jesus made a point, he said, it, it, it says, uh, Peter, he says, sons will be free. We talked about last week about being slaves and being free. If you are a slave, that means you don't have a right. You don't have a right to do what you want to do. You have to obey whoever your master is. But when you are a servant, a servant can have choices. I can choose to serve you. I can choose to help you. I can choose to reject you. I can choose to not do anything for you. Why? Because I'm a servant. One thing I talked about, I love this point I brought out last week. It says a slave has, has it says a slave has to, uh, a servant gets to. A slave does the minimum requirements. A servant reaches the maximum potential. A slave goes one mile. A servant goes extra miles. A slave feels robbed. Feels robbed. Servant gives. And that is so awesome. Then it says a slave is bound, but a servant is free. And that's one thing God wants us to be as children of God is to be free. Will we not allow ourselves to be engulfed in the things of our flesh that cause us to repel against God and hurt somebody else's uh, our feelings or stop them from walking in their, in that purpose God has for you? Because a lot of times you're the closest Jesus somebody going to see. One, another point it says a slave fights for his rights. A servant lays down his rights. And when you lay down your rights, you're telling God, God, I want your will, your plan, your purpose, your thought life to dominate my life. I want you to be in control of my life. I'm willing to give up who I am to follow you. And that's what God looks for. A, a child of God who says, okay, God, I'm not going to live with the attitude of resentment resentment. I'm not going to be stubborn. I'm not going to be prideful, but I'm going to trust you at your word because I know if I trust your word, your word is going to produce life on the inside of me, which causes me to live in the fullness of who you are. And we have to get in ourselves the attitude of Christ, knowing that with confidence that without Christ, I can do nothing. But with Christ, God in our lives, all things are possible to him that believeth. It's so important as a child of God 
to walk in your freedom, walk in your purpose, walk in your authority. God has given you through the power of the word of God. When you get the word of God inside of you, the word of God is like blood. It's like blood in your veins. The word of God begins to produce life throughout your entire body. If your blood decides to stop running in your body, what's going to happen? Anybody. Somebody write a comment on here tonight. If the blood stops running in your body, what's going to happen to you? You're right. We got to keep trusting, believing. And, and that's what we got to do. If the blood stops running in our bodies, we're going to die. Some need blood gets so low, they have to have the blood have to have to have a blood transfusion. Why? Because your blood is not being produced enough to keep you alive. So they gotta give you additional blood to help you begin to produce life in you. And that's what God did with Jesus Christ. He gave us the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. The blood of the Lamb. If you stop, yeah, if your blood stops, you stop. That's right. And God gave us the blood of the lamb and the blood of the lamb, it gave us the supernatural blood. And that supernatural blood, hallelujah, I'm getting excited, y'all, I'm getting ahead of myself. The supernatural blood, it, it begins, to, it empowers you, it charges you up, it ignites the fire of the Holy Ghost inside of you to make you want to tell the good news of the gospel to somebody you see perishing. It makes you want to talk about Jesus. You just can't be quiet when the blood is running warm in your vein. When the blood is running warm in your vein, you got to tell somebody, hey, let me tell you about a Savior who has the power to save your soul, who has the power to stop you from drinking, who has the power to stop you from thugging, who has the power to stop you from whoremonging and lying and being a dungeon and a thief. He, his blood has the power to do anything in your life to change you. But you got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that allow him to come to your life to change your life. Hallelujah. I was looking up something here tonight. It's in our God questions. It says, what does it mean to be a stumbling block to someone else? What does it mean to be a stumbling block to, uh, to someone else? In the midst of a series of laws and regulations, the treatments of others, we find do not curse the deaf, or putting his thumb in blocks in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am I am the Lord. Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 14, in the English Standard Version says, You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. It says, Obviously, putting a rock or a brick in front of a blind person is cruel. You understand that? If you put a rock, you see a blind person come walking towards you and you stick your foot out and they can't see your foot in front of them. That's about to cause them to trip and stumble and fall. And, but you know what you're doing. So you stick your foot out there anyway as a joke. And now all of a sudden they trip over your foot and they get seriously injured. Now you got a lawsuit against yourself because you've done something you shouldn't have done. God says here, he says, don't even be a stumbling block to, uh, to the blind. We, we know that blindness in reference to lost is, is reference to those who don't know their way to Jesus Christ. And that's why I said earlier that we are the closest to Jesus somebody going to see. So it's obviously putting a rock or brick in front of a blind person is cruel, but the New Testament takes the practical, practical adage and turns into a spiritual metaphor. And after Peter rebuked Jesus, dying Dying the crucifixion will take place. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's, right? Peter, under, under the influence of Satan, tried to distract Jesus from what he had come to do. He tried to make Jesus stumble in his path to the crucifixion. Paul reiterates the idea, but we preach Christ crucified. The Jews a stumbling block to the Gentiles' foolishness. The idea that the Messiah would be crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews, somewhat, something that tripped, tripped up their belief of what the Messiah would be like. So you got to understand here, when you get to reading about, about how the Jews expected Jesus to come, they were looking for this, 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 this king to come forth with power and authority to over, overthrow the jurisdiction of the Romans. And to set God's people free. 
from the judicial from the law and from the law and from bondage of, of the Jew of the Romans of the Romans and, and because of this they had to continue to keep seeing this Jesus talking about I'm gonna be crucified I'm going to the cross I'm gonna give my life but when I, he says you destroy the temple three days and raise it raise it up again I'm gonna go in the grave three days and three nights I'm gonna rise, rise it again on the third day with all power thrown in my hand they couldn't accept that that was a stumbling block to them. It was a stumbling block to their belief system. Even though the Old Testament reference to the Messiah to come, Isaiah, he prophesied about the Messiah coming and what was going to take place. And he knew that the Messiah would be a stumbling block to the Jews' belief system because they were not letting go of the religious laws. They were stuck in religion. And so many people are stuck in religion today when God tries to bring something to set you free, your mind is stuck in your system of cycles of beliefs to where you can't believe anything outside of your jurisdiction. People set up their own spiritual jurisdictions and this is where my belief system is. This is where the buck stops here. You're not going to change what I believe. You're not going to stop me from believing what I believe. And this is who I am. I heard people tell me that, you know what? My daddy used to drink. My mama used to drink. His daddy used to drink. So I'm going to keep on drinking until I die. So anything they did is in my, is in my generation. We all do the same thing. Religion, blindness, mis misconstrued, deception, because the enemy perverts the bloodline to make you think the things that your ancestors have done is the same way of life for you today. And God is trying to get us to see where it, we have to change our mentality and our own viewpoint of how we view the cross. People view the cross this man dying on the cross for sin of the whole world, it's ridiculous. It don't make sense. This man, Jesus, going to die on the cross, going to go in the grave, and on the third day rise again. It don't make sense. That's why God says he take the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Because God knew that so many people had needed to be liberated in their mentalities, in their belief system. And today, people are still stuck in the belief system. I'm coming to church when I get myself together. How many times do you heard people say that? I'm coming to church when I get myself together. And they never get themselves together, so they never come to church. Until they come rolled in. Or rolled into a funeral home, now you came to church. When you had the opportunity presented over and over and over to you to get yourself right with the Lord, but you waited till it was too late. I heard a song say, please don't let it be too late. You need to come to Jesus right now. And the thing, the thing is, we hear the word of God. We say we're trusting in God. We're saying we're believing in God. We're saying we're living for God until the truth comes in our life. Will somebody do something to make us mad in the church? I'll stop going to church. So I really didn't have my heart anchored in Christ. I had my, my, my belief system and my anchor in people. And that's where we have to get to the place in ourselves. Stop allowing people to dictate to you what you can and cannot do. Then it says the idea of Messiah will be crucified was a stumbling block to the Jews. So it became a stumbling block. But most of the time, a stumbling block refers to something or someone who keeps another from the relationship with God. Isn't that something? A stumbling block is something in reference of another person preventing somebody else from having a relation with God. Matthew chapter 18, 5 through, five through uh, 7. Matthew chapter 18, 5 through 7. And this is in the English Standard Version. It says, whoever receives one such child in, in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of the little ones who believes in me to sin, it will be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. My God, my God, my God. That is deep. That is deep. My God, that's deep. And we got to get to a place in ourselves where we recognize 
what we're doing and how we're offending God by putting stumbling blocks in somebody else's pathway. We got to wake up, church. We got to wake up and recognize what am I doing? How am I living? Am I walking in the path of truth and what God has called me to be? Or am I walking in my own belief system? It says, woe to the world for temptation to sin. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. You can be a temptation to somebody else because of the way you believe, because of your mouth, the way you try to persuade people to do something wrong because you're doing something wrong. You can cause somebody else to stumble. For example, if I was an alcoholic and God delivered me, and a person come around me who's an alcoholic. And they keep on trying to tempt me. Oh, go on, take this little bit. It ain't going to hurt you. Go on, get this here. It ain't going to hurt you. And the more I hang around an individual, instead of rebuking that spirit that's coming at me of a stumbling block they're trying to put in my pathway, I accept it. So I hang around them. Corrupt communication corrupts good manners. So if they come to me with an enticing words to tempt me, those enticing words, if I don't recognize it's the enemy behind the words that's speaking to me to entrap me, guess what it becomes? A snare. It becomes a trap. So now I find myself falling into the pitfall of despair because I refuse to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Second, what is that? First Corinthians 10, 13, I think it is. It says, therefore, is now no, no temptation taking you, but such that is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will with the temptation make a way to escape you may be able to bear it. So God knows what stumbling block the enemy is going to put in your pathway. He knows what roadblock he's going to put in your way to prevent you from going forward in your purpose, in your calling, and the plan God has for your life. He knows what to do to distract you. But if you're not spending time in the presence, you find yourself vulnerable. You find yourself vulnerable. And it's easy to stumble in the pathway of sin than stay in righteousness. Only when you turn your eyes away from Jesus. Remember the story of Peter? How Peter was on the boat and the storm was going on and Jesus came walking on the water <coughs> and they thought it was a ghost. And Peter said, Lord, if that really you, then bid me to come to you walking on the water. Jesus said, come. He started walking in the water. How many times you lost out doing something in faith, trusting God, but then here come your best friend, so-called best friend, to tell you something to distract you from focusing on what your purpose is. So before you know it, you'll slip back in drug addiction, get back into sin, do the things your flesh loves to do the most. One little leaven or one little stumbling block will cause you to fall right back in the place where God brought you from. All because you allow one individual to come into your life to turn your eyes. <clears throat> so we have to be careful of who we allow to speak into our ear gates. Who you allow into your heart. Because everybody that claims to be for you is really not for you. They're looking for a weak spot inside of you to get you to fall. So even when Jesus had an encounter about different situations <coughs> concerning eating, food devoted to idols, folk got mad about that too. And the reason why is because anything devoted to idols is according to their belief system. So they worship these things. But if I choose to take something to eat, that was devoted to an idol, and I pray over it 
rebuke that spirit and I eat it, I'm satisfied. But now I become a stumbling block to the one who's in sin, who feels that's their idol, and anything you ate for that's devoted to my idol, now you 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 you're offending me. So we gotta be on guard, we gotta be alert, we gotta lay down our rights, we gotta trust God. So tonight we want to talk about laying down your rights, laying down our rights. After Jesus established his liberty in reference to the te temple tax, he was careful to charge the disciples with, with, this, with the importance of humility. He was careful to charge his disciples about the importance of humility. And we all know about humility. If you walk around in a prideful heart, you're not humble. If you find yourself feeling big, bitter, bigger than the beggars, you're not humble. Because a lot of times we walk down a pathway, we see somebody in need, and I won't even help them. Knowing you have the means to help them, and you choose not to help them. In Matthew chapter 7, go to Matthew chapter 7 here. This is, this is something God popped in my spirit. My, my, my. Thank you, Lord God. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Verse 3. And why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, but considers not the beam that's in thy own eye. How or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me put the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote in thy brother's eye. That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. And this is dealing with stumbling blocks. Because I can judge you for something you're doing wrong, but I'm doing the same thing. And Jesus makes it clear. Here's what he's saying. So if I come to you, one of you, and I say, you know what? I saw you in the club last night, and you know you're a preacher. You shouldn't be in there. You're wrong for that. God going to get you for that. And they both be a Christian, and they're in the same club. So I'm judging you on the standards that I'm doing the same thing, but I'm not judging myself. And Jesus puts it this way. How can you judge somebody else about the sin in their life, and you're not dealing with the sin in your own life? How can you deal with the slander coming out of your, their mouth, and you're doing the same thing, talking about folk backbiting and gossiping out of your own mouth? He said, first judge yourself. Remove the sin out of your life first before you try to correct anybody else. And that's a problem we have in the body of Christ. We're quick to judge one another on what we're doing wrong or the shortcomings and failures we have in our lives, but I overlook my own faults. And God is saying tonight, lay down your own rights. Let go of yourself. Because if I make you right first, then you have the right to go help your brother who stumbled. I cannot help anybody who stumbled if I'm stumbling myself in the same way. <coughs> Excuse me. So we got to get to the place where we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our hearts. Reveal to me the sin in my heart. Because I can receive the things wrong with me and you clean me up. Then after I have been strengthened. What did Jesus tell Peter? He said, Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. In other words, to shred you, strip you up, destroy you. But I pray for you that your faith fail you not. And he said, but when you have been strengthened, strengthen your brothers. Why? Because the same measure that I meet It'll be measured back to me. So if I judge you righteously, then God judged me righteously. But if I come to you and I'm just a hypocrite and a lying deceiver and I'm doing the same thing you're doing, I can't tell you how to live right. 
because I had to order myself. Until I get myself right with God, then God comes to my life. He changed my mind, cleansed my thought life, healed my broken heart, delivered me from sin and iniquity that's in my heart and set me on straight street. And then he changes my destiny and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a fruitful and abundant and a free life in Christ Jesus. The reason why so many people have broken marriages, broken homes, messed up children, is because you never dealt with the root cause of the issues in the bloodline. God showed me this recently. He said the reason why so many different people have the same problems and issues from one generation, next generation, next generation, is because something that happened in the prior generation, before that generation came to be, they'd never been dealt with. Just like if my father's adulterous, and his father's adulterer, and his, his father was adulterer, it's in the bloodline. So the bloodline has been perverted, it's been corrupted. So when I identify the bloodline has been corrupted and perverted through adultery, and a lot of times it's a spiritual, spiritual issue. Because the spiritual issue of adultery is cheating on God. Not just people, but we cheat on God. We do when we don't go to church. Because I'd rather stay home, watch TV service, I'd rather stay home, I'd rather go to shopping centers, I'd rather do this, I'd rather do this to please myself, but I ain't got to go to church. I'm cheating on God. I'm adulterating in my house. I can understand if you have a condition where you have to stay home with your condition. But we need to be real with ourselves, stop adulterating and making a lie and excuse for the reason why I don't want to do certain things that God tell me to do. I was one of those. God called me to preach. I ran from God. I started drinking. I started partying. started doing weed, doing whatever I can to keep from doing what God come and do. Because I was mad at my father. Being mad at my father because the way I felt I was disrespected and mistreated growing up. So I held on to that root cause of all this stuff which was affecting me in my future because of the bloodline. The same things that happened in my generation happened in generations before. And God said, when you recognize it's a spiritual condition, I can cleanse the bloodline. Because the bloodline of the curse that was guaranteed to be deemed in your life, I can cut off, I can purify, I can saturate in the anointing and make you clean. So your generation that comes after you will not be affected by the same thing that was in your bloodline. That, that's a good word. That's a good word. I preached myself on that one. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So laying down your rights. After Jesus established his liberty in reference to the temple tax, remember we talked about last week how Jesus didn't want to offend the tax collectors and, and the Jewish people. So he told, told one disciple, go down to the lake, you know, or to the sea. The first fish you find, get the coin and pay our taxes. And he did that. You know, beat us so long. He could have very well said, no, I ain't paying no law because I'm, I'm Lord of the law. I'm this, I'm that. But because of his humility, he did what they wanted to do to respect them. And that's what we have to do a lot of times, to respect one another. We have to do some things we don't want to do sometimes for the better of that person of coming to the Lord. If it means take them to the store, buy them an outfit. If it means take them to the store, buy them some shoes, buy them some food just so they can come to church. Sometimes we don't want to do that. We got the means to do it, but we want to do it. I don't want to do that. And God says we have to get to a place in ourselves when we walk in humility and we tell God, God, I'm doing this for the glory of God. Have your way in me. Jesus says like this, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin will be better for him if a millstone, this means a large stone, was tied around his neck, and he was drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses must come. But woe to the man by whom the offense comes. You understand what he's talking about here? Here's another, another point. He says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better to enter to eternal life 
lame or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet and be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven the angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. This cha entire chapter of Matthew is about offenses. Jesus clearly is saying, get rid of what causes sin, even if one of your New Testament, if it's one of your New Testament privileges. If it causes a weakness in your brother to sin, cut it off from before him. So if I come to you with one of the New Testament privileges of the gospel, and I know it's going to offend you, he said, don't even do it. Because anything we preach, we have to come in love. I found this out to be so true when witnessing other people. If I come to them and beat them down with the word, just beat them with the word, they get offended, they get angry, they never come to Christ. I know a preacher like that this very day who's a gloom and doom preacher. He preached nothing but judgment and hellfire from the word of God. And he got scriptures to back it up. And the Lord said, that the only way he would draw people to himself if what? He's lifted up. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And that's what Christ wants to do, be lifted up in our lives. If I lift the Savior up, he said, I will draw all men unto me. Not you, not me, him. By glorifying him through our humility, our servanthood, our love, he said, all men know you're my disciples by your love. So if I come loving a, a sinner man and tell them the sentiment of his evil ways that you can change, that God can deliver and set you free, he said, then that person will be born again. But we get to the place in ourselves, we see a person who we know is not born again. Instead of sharing the gospel, we walk away from them. Instead of serving somebody, I go serve somebody else who's better than I am. That's not true humility. It's not true servanthood. Because true servanthood, it's going to the hedges and highways. I remember the man who told, who, when Jesus told the parable of the, of the man who had a, a wedding, had a feast. And he, he told him, he said, go get all the dignitaries, get all these different people of high extremist qualities, bring them to this feast. Everybody had an excuse. And the, the owner of the house got mad. So here's what I want you to do then. Because they're not coming Go into the hedges and the highways, get the lame, the blind, the, the cripple, all these people, and bring them in. Then my house may be filled. Why? Because that wasn't worthy, he said, to eat at my table. And we have to get to the place where we recognize, am I walking in humility? Or am I walking in selfish pride? Because selfish pride will make you overlook the less fortunate. Selfish pride will make you overlook the person standing on the street corner who needs a ride and you know you're going the same direction. And God says tonight, we need to be careful how we treat one another because you cannot enter to the kingdom of heaven with your heart not right before God. That way he said, your foot call you sin, cut it off. Your eye call you sin, cut it off. Take it out. All this stuff. Because we got to be clean. We got to live in righteousness. Got to live in love and humility and be concerned and caring about other people. You may wonder then why Jesus was offending so many as we saw in previous chapters in the book. The answer is simple. Jesus offended people as a result of obeying the Father and serving others. If you read, read in the parables, read the stories of Jesus, you find out people were offended for him doing good. Man had a sheep fell into a ditch on the Sabbath day. And he goes to get the sheep. People offended because he did it on the Sabbath day. Jesus healed the paraclesia. He healed the lame man on the Sabbath day. So what, he opened the blind on the Sabbath day. Why? Because the Sabbath day is considered a holy day. So the Sabbath day, anything that's done and works on the Sabbath day is forbidden in the law of Moses. So Jesus comes along telling them, 
These things that you read about, they bear witness who I am. I'm what the law is. I'm a brother. I'm before Moses, Aaron, Isaac, and Jacob was. I am. That offended them. Because he knew that the life that he came to live was to be a servant in order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. His offense did not come by demanding his own rights. His offense did not come by demanding his own rights. The Pharisees were offended when he healed on the Sabbath. His disciples were offended by the truth his father had him to preach. Mary and Martha were offended when he delayed his return to heal Lazarus. But, will, but, will, but you will not find Jesus offending others by serving himself. Paul, in his letter to Corinthians, gave this warning. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours, the liberty of yours, become a stumbling block for those who are weak. We have to be careful. We don't become a stumbling block to the weak. There are many people who are not strong as you are in spirituality. They're not strong as you are in your belief system in Christ. They don't have the same type of faith you have that they're strong in the Lord. And you have to be aware that there are people who serve the Lord, who are born again believers, they're weak Christians. And they have to learn how to grow and mature in their purpose, in their identity of who Christ is in them. Our liberty has been given for us to serve and laying down our lives. We are to build, not destroy. No was this liberty given for us to heap things on ourselves because we have to use it in this manner. Many, many today are offended by the lifestyle of a Christians, of Christians. People are offended when they see a Christian become successful. Many are offended when they see Christians have businesses. They're offended when you seem to be prosperous financially. They become offended because you got what they want. But the thing is, God show me something. People get offended of successful Christians because they don't want to do the work themselves to get where they are. If you want success in any area of your life, you have to get to the place of humility because the greatest way up is humility. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Hear what? He lift you up. When I humble myself, and I write my vision, and I make it plain, that all may see me run with it. Though the vision tarry is yet for an appointed time, but it will surely come to pass. Even though it delays, it will surely come to pass. And I wait on God, and I do the work to bring this vision into fruition. God says, when I do the work, what he requires, faith without works is dead. If I do the work, to bring this vision into fruition, God said, you know what? I won't bless it. Because you're doing what my heart desires for you to do is line it up with me. Then now I can cause your vision to prosper and come to pass in your life. Hallelujah. Again here, here to the warning given us in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Here's an example how I've seen this commandment broken. On my second ministry trip in Indonesia, I took Lisa and my children and the babysitter. We arrived in uh, Denpasar, Bali, a Bali, a resort island. An elder in the church, we were visiting on a modest hotel in a very noisy section of town. We had traveled a long distance and had very little sleep. We were exhausted. That night, we, we were awakened several times by loud noises and barking dogs. We only stayed overnight and did not get the rest we needed. The following day, we continued on to Java and ministered for the next two weeks on, on a very busy schedule. We had only one day free in two, two weeks. And that was the first for, that was for our travel. In one 24-hour period, we ministered five times at a church in 30, with 30,000 members. Wow. At the end of the trip, we were scheduled to go back through Bali. 
the pastor informed us that he he would be that we'll be staying at the hotel again at the other hotel. He said we're not thrilled about being in those conditions again after two solid weeks of ministry. At breakfast on the morning we were to leave for Java for Bali, a precious lady offered uh, to pay for our accommodations at one of the finest resort hotels in Bali. I was so excited because we would get rest and stay in a beautiful place. As we left the restaurant, the restaurant uh, to pack, Lisa told me she did not feel good about accepting the lady's offer. The interpreter and I reasoned with her and said it would be fine. Again on the plane from Java to Bali, she, she, did, she said she, she didn't think we were doing the right thing. That what his wife told him. She said, you're not doing the right thing because this, this elder got you here. This elder got a hotel and he got you in this, in this hotel and he's he taking care of you. But this one lady comes along and wants to offer him a better place in a better location. And his wife tells him, no, I don't feel good about that. I don't feel it's a good, good thing to do. I was foolish. I didn't listen to her. So I told, told her it wouldn't cost the church anything. It would be fine. And when we arrived in Bali, she pleaded with me at the, at the baggage claim one more time, but I ignored her. When I met the pastor, I told him we would not need to stay in the elders' hotel because the woman's offer. He seemed uneasy with what, we had, what I had said. So I asked him what was wrong. Fortunately, he was open to me, open with me and said, John, this would offend the elder and his family. They were already reserved the room for you. They already reserved the room for you, and they sold and they were sold out for the evening. I had also apparently offended the pastor because I did not appreciate what they had arranged for us. Finally, I told him we would stay in the elder's hotel and pass up the woman's offer. The Lord dealt with me about my attitude, and I knew the pastor was hurt. I saw the demanding rights and I offended this brother. And that was sin. I asked for his forgiveness. He forgave me. And I hope I don't ever have to learn that lesson again. And that's one thing about it. When the Holy Spirit is leading you to do something, there's going to be easiness, a calmness in your spirit. You're going to have peace about it. But when it's not of God, it's not going to come together. It's going to offend somebody in your pathway. We have to be careful the things we say, the things we agree with, who we allow to persuade us to do things that's not of God because we become an offense to God by our disobedience. Just like this pastor, when after, after he realized what his wife was telling was the truth, not to do this, don't go to this, lady, this place this lady trying to get you to go to, but stay here in the elder's facility he realized then his eyes became open to see I was an offense to the pastor. I was an offense to God because I was leading my own self and my own feelings because of what I went through and the experience I dealt with. So when God begins to speak, we need to learn how to sometimes be quiet and listen. And one thing about God, he never leads you in a pathway to hurt you. Anything God does is good and very good for your benefit because he wants you to be in health even as your soul prospers because we trust in his ability to lead, guide, direct, and, and do what he chooses in our lives for the better. So I pray this helps somebody. Anybody got any questions tonight? Anyone got any questions or comments? So we got to get to a place in ourselves we realize I'm not on this journey by myself. When it comes to the body of Christ, you might have a leader that you don't agree with. He might be making choices and decisions you don't understand. Don't get mad at the leader. Pray for him. Because there may be something that God is trying to prune inside of you to perfect you, to make you better. But instead, you and your feelings and emotions and you're uptight, and you're upset, and you're creating more havoc in your own life. And they're going over their life in peace. Offense is a very dangerous tool the enemy uses against people, saved or unsaved. If you don't believe it, look at the news. Road rage, offense. Somebody getting shot driving down the road, offense. 
because you cut me off, I'm going to shoot you. Abuse in the families because you offended me. So I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to abuse the children. All because I was offended. And God says tonight, if you one of those who can identify with the spirit of offense and it's in your heart, you need to allow God to purge it out. Allow him to purge it out because if you don't, it's going to mess up your destiny. It'll be a stumbling block in your pathway and offense to God. And God wants to purify. He wants to saturate. He wants to perfect you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to sanctify and make you holy. But he cannot do it if you have a spirit of offense in your heart. Quick to fly off the handle. Quick to cuss somebody out. Quick to have, have an argument. I have never seen so many Christians get so mad enough they want to always argue and defend themselves over something that don't make no sense. Be something so minute. My mother used to tell me, you take a mole here, turn to a mountain. Because I used to get so mad. And it made, it made a lot of sense when she said it. Because we can take the little bitty things, the little bit of sin, a little leaven, and leaven a whole lump. Take a little bit of sin and corrupt not just my life, but everybody that's connected to me. Because I'm offended. So God is saying tonight, if you're one of those, who's been attached, hear what I just said, attached to the spirit of offense. God wants to sever it. You ever had a, a, a wound and you had to go to the emergency and it wouldn't stop bleeding? They had to cauterize it, right? They had to take a hot instrument to cauterize the bleeding, to make it stop bleeding. It's painful and it hurts, but it helps. Because they don't cauterize the wound and it keeps bleeding, you're going to bleed out. Life flowing out of you until you eventually you die. That's what the enemy does. He severs you to wound you, to hurt you, to corrupt you so you can bleed out. And God says the Holy Spirit comes along with a cautering iron to heal your wound, to stop it from bleeding, in order to replenish the life that you lost that's found in Jesus Christ. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for this message tonight, oh God. I pray that we all have ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church, that you bring conviction in our hearts, change our hearts, purify our hearts, saturate our hearts, deliver our hearts, and set us free from the inside out. And then you fill it. You fill the empty spaces in our hearts with your presence, with your glory, with your anointing, that you would empower us to live in the liberty where Christ has made us free and no longer be entangled with a yoke of slavery. And I thank you, Lord God, for what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As always, hallelujah. As always, if you're on here tonight and you're a backslider or a sinner who don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the word says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans verse chapter 10, verse 9, Romans 10 and 9 says that, thou, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You can be born again tonight and have a relationship with Jesus Christ and know that your life will be eternally set to live in glory when you pass away from this life. And you won't have to spend eternity in lake in the hell of lake fire because of redempt, the redemption through the blood of the Lamb that's made you clean and saved you from going to hell.
And I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I ask you, Lord God, to forgive me for my sins, knowing and unknowing. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I thank you for cleansing me and saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, glory to God, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that made a choice to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a link attached on this live. The link I put on it every week is, is pinned on here. If you want to sow a donation into the project or into the Bible class, ministry, sow your seed. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter how much there's. It can be a dollar. It can be two dollars. be five dollars. be ten dollars. Whatever seed God put in your heart, sow that seed in faith, believing for something you're praying for God to do in your life. I believe in seed sowing. I believe in sowing seeds. I do it all the time in people's lives. And every time I sow my seed, God always bless me. And that's, that's the gospel truth. I can swear in the Bible with that. Because I believe that when I give, as the word says, it will come back to me. Good measures, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give it to my bosom. Every time I give, it comes back to me. Because I trust God in his word. He said, don't give of a necessity. Don't give grudgingly, but give with a cheerful heart. And I give in obedience to what God has promised me to give. And every time, God brings it right back to me even more. So I encourage you to sow a seed into the ministry and believe God. And I'm going to believe God with you. That seed, whatever you sow, whatever it is you're expecting God to do in your life, you got to have expectancy. You got to believe it too. Because without faith, it ain't going to happen. Faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And that's the truth. That works in the spiritual realm with a Christian and a non-Christian. Because faith is not prejudice. Faith works with anybody. A sinner man, a dope man got faith. So he can sell this dope man and live in a mansion. He got faith. I can get any car I want. And here it is, we Christians claim we got faith in God and we selfish. We're stingy. But yet we got faith in God. And one thing about God, I believe what God says. When I give to him, I can't be this giving. You can't be God giving. The more you give, the more he gives back to you. I'm going to leave you on that note tonight. I pray you stay encouraged, you stay excited about Jesus, and know with confidence that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Today is a great day to make it a great day, so make it a great day on purpose, a great evening on purpose, a great night on purpose, and walk in your purpose for purpose. For God has not given the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. So use that on tonight. Know you have power and a sound mind over fear. Now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest in the Bible with us, henceforth now and forever. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If no one have any questions tonight, you can inbox me if you have any questions later on. Some cross your mind. You want to get in contact with me, feel free to contact me. I don't mind discussing the word of God with you. Feel free to contact me. I thank my pastor for coming on tonight too. And Pastor uh, uh, Deborah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Pastor, pastor uh, Terry, God bless you. Pastor Denise, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming on tonight. Share this video with somebody else. And Lakeisha, God bless you. Share this video with somebody else. And I guarantee you'll be a blessing to somebody else just by sowing this word into their life. And I pray God continue to keep you all in his will, in his plan, and his purpose. He established for the foundation of the world just for you. Until next week at 6 o'clock p.m., you be blessed and have a beautiful and a prosperous week in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless. Good night.